going to ask you to join me in Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to pick up reading with verse number 18. I really do, folks, consider it a privilege uh, to be able to stand with you today and go into God's Word. We believe it's God's book. And if we didn't, we'd do things a whole lot different around here, I promise you. I might even be able to do one of those sermonettes for Christianettes. But since we believe the Bible to be God's book, we take it real serious. In fact, get a little bit excited. And I thought about it a few minutes ago. I try to get people to uh, get excited about what we do here. We need nobody to do it. So I decided maybe we'll outlaw excitement. Okay? And then you'll probably be swinging from the chandelier. I don't know. Start getting out of hand. It's okay by me, all right, as long as we do it according to the book. But anyway, Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to pick up reading verse number 18, and uh, study entitled this morning, What's Really at Stake? What's Really at Stake? Hebrews 12, 18. For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched, that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, the sound of a trumpet, the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But you are come under Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel what's really at stake. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to join me as I pray and ask God for blessing here so that I don't get in His way and don't mummock up His Word, but that He would come and make us to understand what we're looking at. Will you join me? Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we have access by His blood into Your presence. I don't understand it, and I know it makes no sense whatsoever, but yet I know it's so. <coughs> And because of that, then, God, by faith this morning, we're asking you for a specific blessing now. I know there have been many prayers prayed today already by probably everyone, if not uh, at least most everyone in this room. But we're praying right now for one specific thing. And God, that's that you would pour us out a blessing right now on your word. I can't do it. At best, I would get in your way. I would botch up what you would like to do. But Lord, you can fix all of that. And you come out getting the glory and the praise and the pleasure from what's done here. So that's what we're asking, Lord. Keep all flesh and blood under the radar. And please pour us out now blessing such that we can grasp more of our inheritance and grow because of our being here today. I prayed in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Verse 14 of chapter 12 tells us that God's people are going to be holy people. Now, if you're anything like me, probably for years you've heard words uh, that what, roll off the tips of disciples' tongues they're familiar to our ears, but there may be folks who don't understand what's being talked about. Like this word holy. Whatever it means, we're told in verse 14, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. To be holy literally means to be set apart to God completely. It's important that we get that little aspect in there. To be holy literally means to be set apart from self and sin completely. To be holy literally means a daily life of obedience. To borrow a phrase from one of the old hymns of the faith, to be 
holy literally means striving to please Him in all that I do. Someone suggested that being holy is like being married to one person every day, every hour of every day. A faithful husband, a faithful wife is just that. They're faithful. They're faithful to their vows. They're faithful to their promises. Uh, a faithful husband, a faithful wife is faithful physically, uh, faithful mentally, faithful socially, if you will. You say, well, what exactly does that mean? Well, I break it down this way. A faithful husband or wife is someone uh, who this could be said about. You don't mess around with anybody else. You don't think about messing around with anybody else. And you don't mess around with anyone else everywhere you are, whether your spouse is with you or not. You're completely married or you're unfaithful. Only two ways of viewing that thing. You can't be one-fourth married. You say, what does that mean? Well, you act like you're married 25% of the time. That won't work. You can't be one-third married or act like you're married one-third of the time. You can't even be half married. Act like you're married only half of the time. If you're a fourth married, a third married, a half married, that means you're unfaithful. It's just that simple. There's no gray area there. And the same is true of this idea of holiness, being set apart to God. You can't be a fourth holy. You can't be a third holy. You can't be half holy. You can't be holy on Sunday and hellish Monday through Saturday. You can't live for God on weekends, live for self during the week. You can't sing, pray, shout, and hallelujah on Sunday, and then drink, cuss, carouse, fornicate on Saturday night, lie, cheat, steal, and break the law Monday through Friday. You can't act saved on Sunday and then live lost Monday through Saturday. That's not holy, and that's not how you go see God. Now, if anybody here is saying, I wish you'd make it a little more plain, I'm wore out already. I don't know what else to tell you. But Paul prays this prayer, if you will, for our holiness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, where the same word found in 1214, holiness, is translated differently as sanctify. And he makes this prayer. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Or in other words, the very God of peace make you holy completely. And I pray God, he continues, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody says, okay, what part of me then will holiness affect? Only your spirit, your soul, and your body. Anything else you can do with what you want to. Amen? Somebody says, well, I have to be holy how long? Just till the Lord comes back. Okay? You're getting all this, I hope. Amen. Somebody says, well, is this a required course or is it merely an elective? It is a required course of conduct only if you plan on seeing the Lord. Y'all, somebody said one time, you act like you believe exactly what the Bible says. Amen. 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 And that's all you're ever going to get. You want anything different, you're going to have to go to the library and get another card. Preaching the Bible is the only job of any pastor. That's why we make a big deal about the Word of God around here. And that's why I, in particular, like to pay close attention to every single word that's used. In fact, that word, see, in 12, 14, to see the Lord, is one out of seven words used in New Testament Greek that's translated to see. Now, I always at least attempt to pronounce it. It's never right. If it ever was right, it would be an accident, okay? Be sure and get that in mind. But the word goes something along this line, uh, translated to see in 1214. Optano mahi, optano And it means to gaze at with wide open eyes as at something remarkable. To gaze at 
with wide open eyes as if seeing something remarkable. Some of you are thinking, I thought I heard you uh, use that word just the other night. Well, I did. Same word used, John 1.51, when Jesus is talking to Nathaniel and what he needs to expect as a disciple. He says, you're going to see the same word, uh, you're going to gaze at with wide open eyes as if you're looking at something remarkable. You're going to see angels descending and ascending from heaven down on the Son of Man, and it's going to just shock you. What do you guess those disciples saw? Y'all, we're just giving a little smattering. John said if we were to write everything that he did down in the, in the book, a book, the world wouldn't be able to hold all the books written. You guess he did much? Talk about a to-do list. Y'all will listen. This definition now sets it apart from the six other words that God chooses to use in various other parts of the New Testament. Number one meant to stare. Number two meant voluntary observation. Number three is mechanical or casual vision. Number four is to look closely at. Number five is to be a spectator. Number six to watch at a distance. Now all of these definitions are similar but each one paints a slightly different picture. And when you factor that in with what we're learning about our God, our God is not some machine up in the cosmos somewhere. He's not something, He's someone. And we're learning that through His Word, He reaches down as far as He can, and that's tongue-in-cheek, obviously, to choose the exact Word to communicate exactly to us what he wants us to grasp or communicate. Uh, Dave used in our Sunday school class this morning from Luke chapter 24, I think I always had the same lesson. When Jesus told his disciples, I want you to hang out here and wait until you be endued with power from on high. Now if you're like me, you're thinking, endued? What in the world does endued mean? That dude is in such and such? And thankfully, Dave pointed out, it means to be clothed. Clothed. And I'm thinking, there goes God again doing something that you've got to be asleep to miss. When the Holy Spirit comes on someone, it's like putting on a shirt or putting on a jacket or putting on a pair of breeches. Whatever you see as a result of His coming on you, it's not you. Now, I'm some, someday somebody may tell me, that's a pretty tie. Now, they ain't never done it yet. I'm assuming it's because you ain't seen it good. Amen? But nobody's going to say, man, you're a nice tie. You get the point? Man, you sure are a good shirt. And good night, you're a good pair of britches. Biggest I've ever seen, but a good pair the point being, when God comes down, God does the work, God gets the credit. Amen. Period. We've lived through a generation where if God supposedly does come down, it makes us a celebrity. Does that strike anybody as being wrong? It ought to. God's not going to come make someone, you know, this spiritual jelly-filled donut that everyone that gets around you gets a little sweet taste of glory, God's going to come down and do what will give Him praise and Him glory and Him pleasure in spite of me. I mention that just again to reiterate. God will pick a word that He knows will communicate to us exactly what He wants us to get. Let me put it one last way. What do you think we'll do when we first See Jesus. Now one of the little uh, Bible school children asked one of the teachers a few weeks back, do you mean Jesus really is a real person? Uh-huh. That's why we do what we do. Amen. And I'm about half convinced 
that there's a lot of we Baptists that don't nearly believe like we say we do about a lot of things. That's why we can sit like knots on logs. <laughs> when something real exciting is being sung about or preached about, y'all, we're going to see Jesus one day. Amen. And somebody said, well, yeah, but you don't have to get too excited. Well, you may not now, but i got a notion you will be then. Amen. You think you're just going to casually and mechanically stare? Oh, I, know, I guess that's Jesus. What else is for lunch? He picked a word to communicate to anyone who really wanted to spend a moment, and it's going to be like this. It's going to mean to gaze at with wide open eyes as if you're seeing something remarkable. There he stands. Good night, I reckon. I'm real glad I got saved. Anybody else? Amen. By the way, I don't mind if you amen. Not one bit work. Thought I'd make sure you understood that. Listen, if we want this to happen, plain and simple, seeing Him, <laughs> eyes wide open, like we're looking at something remarkable, then we're going to be serious about this thing, holiness. Yeah. So how do you know that? Because that's what it says. There are a lot of people believing a lot of things about Christianity of the day. You couldn't find them if you had four bottles. Heard one say, fellow say one time, man, speaking of so-and-so, he's got a great big one. Make two or three of the one you got. You must not have heard the same one. <laughs> it's in the book. See, that's what makes the difference. If we really want to see him, then we're going to be purposeful about our walk with Christ. We'll be decisive about our walk with Christ. We'll be determined about our walk with Christ. We'll be, if you will, verse 15 of chapter 12, we'll be looking diligently. And why would that be? Because of what's at stake. Amen. Because of what's at stake. Question, what is at stake? Well, answer to that could be looked at this way. There's a decision to make. A decision to make. This decision is going to involve eternity, but this decision is one that has to be made now. I got to thinking about that thing. I feel as if, and I may be wrong, I really may be, we're living in a generation where eternity doesn't seem to have much effect on people. We are so geared toward right here and right now. In fact, every time somebody starts showing the signs of getting older, we go out and buy some kind of goop to wipe on our face so we won't look old again. Anybody? Yeah. Only one amen? I watch Hallmark Channel, y'all. And Hallmark must be geared to old fat people like me because every commercial is get rid of wrinkles, get rid of your belly, and get your insurance in order because you're an old coot and you ain't got so much time left. Amen? <laughs> I never heard him say that, but the implication is clearly there. Scared, slammed to death of not staying like we are. You probably ain't like you were this morning at 8 o'clock. What are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to give you some goop and smear it on my face. I love going in our bathroom and reading the bottle she's got up on the thing there. I love it. A wrinkle eraser. Y'all, it don't exist. If it did, I'd come in here next week looking like a mixture of Elvis Presley, John Wayne, and who the hell ugly boy is that she likes right there? <laughs> Wouldn't I be, all I got to do is goop down, your hair grow, muscles appear. Wouldn't that be nice? People, I don't think, worry too much about eternity. Have you ever noticed you go to a used car lot these days and they'll have a number on the windshield? And that number is how much that thing costs. It's how much it costs this month. Huh? Used to be, hey, $12.95. This will get you what you need, right? $16.50. The first truck I ever bought, $19.95, yo. You're thinking, you must really be old. <laughs> I really am. Ain't like that no more. Hey, for a mere $716 a month, you can push this there. Hopefully, drive this thing off the lot. Everybody's geared toward right now. So we start talking about eternity, and they're thinking, eh, I ain't even sure it exists. How do we 
why not eternity exist? That's it. That's it. Oh, the only way. I've not been to eternity. I've been to Wanchi's. <laughs> this week I went to Henderson. I gotta tell a story, y'all. You're thinking, wait a minute, I didn't pay to come here and listen to you tell stories. I know that. I'll give you a refund. <laughs> we had to make an emergency stop this week for reasons I won't go into. So I pulled off on this side road, and there was no state signs. It had every, uh, what do you say, every evidence of being a, like a non-state road. Now, this is the truth. I'm not making this up. I'm thinking to myself, now, when the law rolls in here behind me and asks me, boy, what are you doing on this private property? Well, there happened to be a little graveyard sitting there. And honestly, what went through my mind was, I said, well, we're just going to check out this cemetery and see if any of my folks are buried there. Now, I'm thinking this. You're thinking, what kind of a mind do you live with? It ain't easy, I'm telling you. <laughs> Turn the truck around, she's on the telephone. The first thing I saw in the graveyard was my last name on a tombstone. I'm telling you, we got out and looked, there was like 15 Romans all buried there. I'm thinking, <laughs> ain't that a fascinating story? Uh, it really did happen. Anyway, I've never seen an eternity. The Bible says there's an eternity. This decision has to be made now, though it affects eternity. <clears throat> and this decision has to be made based on th things not yet seen. Amen. Man, they ain't giving me much hope. Well, I hate, to, I hate to use it. I mean, any of you know me, you know I really hate to use this as an illustration. It's like buying homeowner's insurance. Don't you love it? You know, homeowner's insurance, that stuff you pay for for years, and every time you make a claim, sorry, ain't covered. You know what I'm talking about? Your agent tells you, listen, this is what my company will do if your home burns down. And you hope this will never happen, but if it does, your agent has made you promises. Amen? Don't you love them? Now, you don't see these benefits yet but based on the information given you you make a decision you write a check for something that you've yet to see okay. John says it first John chapter 5 you believe the witness of men why don't you believe witness of God thought about it the other day you probably heard us, all of us make fun of weathermen. Wouldn't it be nice to have a job that you can be wrong 50% of the time and get paid? Listen, I thought of another one the other day. What if you had a job when 100% of the time you're wrong and get paid a lot? A politician. <laughs> I'm going to be a political weatherman. I heard somebody laugh about that. Anyway. We look last time, verses 18 through 21, where Paul was reminding his Hebrew audience, uh, this group of folks who had a decision to make, and uh, based on what they saw from back in Exodus 19, they, they made a right decision, but they didn't maintain that decision. What they decided, they decided not to do after all. And now in verse 24, he's instructing his audience and us. He's reminding us what's really at stake. And what's at stake here is where you'll spend eternity. Or to put it another way, if eternity doesn't ring your bell, where will you go when you die? Now, most of us don't like think about stuff like that. In fact, I heard tell, and uh, I wish Marty weren't here because he may take offense at this. Uh, one old boy paid to have his great grandma twice removed, you know, put away when she finally died, and he didn't make the appropriate payments. And they sent him a letter pay up, or she's coming up. <laughs> you didn't hear that? <laughs> What's. Uh, 
Where are you going to go when you die? That's what's at stake here. Put it one last way. When your eyes close in death, then what? If you've been fortunate enough or depending on your experience, unfortunate enough, you may have been in a room where someone died. You may have been right there when they checked out. I'll never forget watching uh, my father-in-law take his last breath. You know, if, if you've been there in a, a death room situation, you, if you're like me, you're, you're like watching them breathe, about like a baby, you know, when they're first born and you're worried about them living. Just watching every breath, watching the chest up and down. And then he gasped kind of deeply, and, and there he was. And my wife uh, uh, just perfectly turned to her mama and said, He's gone. Yeah, that's exactly right. Based on what the Bible says, he's gone. What are you going to see? What am I going to see? What happens when the eyes close in death? Now, a decision's got to be made that involves eternity. But this decision's got to be made, made now, and this decision has got to be maintained from now on. And this decision must be made based on information not yet seen. God has boxed us up in such a way, you're going to listen to what I say, or you're going to ignore what I say. There is no third option. Just that simple. Bottom line, when it comes to the possibility of your home burning down, do you believe it might happen? And when it comes to the subject of eternity, do you believe the Bible or will you ignore the Bible? What's really at stake? I hope no one takes offense at this. It seems to me very simply and shortly stated. It's the choice between Luke 16 and Hebrews chapter 12. It's the choice between Luke 16, 23 uh, and Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, and there is no third option. That's the choice. If you will, Luke 16, 23 through 31 is the tail end of the story, you recall, about a fellow we only know as the rich man and Lazarus. And in verse 23, we're told that the rich man died. In fact, let me turn there so I don't misquote something. In verse 23, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. Now, he'd never been there before. To my knowledge, this is the only account that we have of someone giving an eyewitness account of what it's like to be in hell. Now, in Isaiah 14, we're given the picture of those already in hell greeting Satan as he's brought into hell for that last time. And they rise up to greet him, and they make all kinds of comments about this one that caused the earth to tremble, but who now will be like the rest of us. But here we've got the one account that I'm aware of, of someone being there, and we're told what he saw, and what he felt, and what he said and what he thought, and what he was told. We've seen none of these. And aren't you glad? I don't plan on seeing none of these. How about you? You plan on this? No way, Jose. I don't want to see it. Amen. Good night. Well, it's a description of a place not yet seen. And it's the description of the place that will be seen by the person who chooses to ignore the Bible but it describes a man, involves a man, who actually went there. And again, we're told what he saw. He lift up his eyes, being in torment. Now, y'all, this is a little bit of a stretch, but now, please take it like I offer it. If I'm leaving anything out, it's my fault. I can't blame it on nobody else. Looks to me like this could well be the first thing he saw when he opened his eyes after dying. Forgive me for a personal illustration, maybe just to make a slight point here. Back in my days before Christ, 
uh, I was involved in a lot of things I ought not be involved in. But one night, in fact, the last night I ever had way, 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 way too many drugs in my body. I lost control of my mind. Couldn't, just, my brain went anywhere it wanted to go. And the thought went through my mind, I have died, I'm in hell, and this is what eternity is going to be. An eternity with no control over my thoughts. And I was terrified. It's a good chance this is the first glimpse he got once his eyes had him clothed in death, opened back up on the other side, and the first thing he saw was that he was in torments. Second thing he saw was someone he knew to be a faithful Christian, Abraham, far off in the distance. Came to find out that there was no uh, passage between the two. He understood it was eternal. He understood that he would reached a place where there was no hope. We're told what he felt by way of implication. He was so thirsty that he wanted, you remember the story, for old Lazarus there, who was not with him but with Abraham, if he could but dip his finger in some water and then come back and dip his wetted finger on his tongue. Yo, that's being thirsty, amen? Good night. And what did he say? It dawned on him. What he had never seen really was true. And he asked Abraham, is there any way we can get word back to my brothers who are still alive so they don't end up here where I am? And then we're told what he was told. And if, you will, if you will, and forgive me, rough, rough, very loose paraphrase here. It's all over, Hawks. And if, speaking of your brothers, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they're not going to believe so, even though someone rose from the dead and came back and told, they're just, they've made their mind up. They're just not going to believe. Amen. What's at stake here? Well, it's the choice between one place we've never seen that's not a good place. But thank God, y'all, it don't stop there, amen? There's choice two. There's alternative number two. There's Hebrews 12, verse 22. Now this, too, is a description of a place not yet seen. Now, pardon me for just a minute. I'm going to parallel park. We're going to leave the motor running, though. Aren't you glad for the way God chooses to do what He does? He didn't have to tell us about what heaven was going to be, but He did. Why do you suppose that was? Forgive me, it's an advertisement. He wants us to read and think, man, that's what I want. Anybody here ever go to Burger King? Last time I was there, y'all, they had a picture on the wall in there of like this seven foot diameter whopper. And the french fry was like my arm. And I remember sitting there thinking one day, wouldn't that be something? Y'all are thinking, you really are. I heard a fellow make a statement the other day, you can be twice as smart as you are and still be a moron. <laughs> That's probably me. But y'all whopper flips my switch. I mean, it really did. And those cats that do their marketing, they know what, they ain't got to go fancy wancy and and all this, uh, what, Wi-Fi and all that, put up a picture of a burger, and hey, Hoss will come. Just that same. Why do you guys God did what he did the way he did? He's trying to talk us into listening to something we probably, without him, wouldn't have sense enough to listen to. Mm -hmm. Eternity? I don't even know what that means. Ain't that some kind of perfume the boys wear? <laughs> Eternity. Here he goes, y'all, a description of a place not yet seen. It's the description of a place that will be seen by the person who believes the Bible. And interesting to me, this description doesn't tell us what we're going to feel, say, think, or what we're being told. But this description tells us, again, what could very well be the first glimpse of what we'll see when our eyes open back up. By the way, if you don't plan on dying, you probably won't pay any attention to what I'm telling you. My guess is, you're going to die. 
They say, well, well yeah, but I might get frozen. <laughs> and in 50 gazillion years from now, they're going to thaw me out. They're going to put me in a microwave. Well, if they did do that, if they could do that, guess what? You're going to come back with all your wrinkles and bald head just like you left, right? Amen. <laughs> I hate to pop your bubble, but anyway. Looks to me like the only thing covered here is not, again, what you're going to feel, what you're going to say, or what you're going to think. But did you notice what we're told? You're come to Mount Zion. Now, obviously, you're not there, but it's like you pull up in the parking lot and you're looking at that seven-foot whopper on the window. This is an advertisement. You've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. Now, I don't know about you. Every time I see a picture of the White House, I think of our government. I ain't going to say nothing like I'd like to say, but just borrow that picture. The picture of the White House, I'm assuming, around the world, tells people, hey, that's America's capital. About like seeing Buckingham Palace. Y'all just saw it. Or the Taj Mahal, or whatever. It, it communicates. But listen, my thinking is, we're going to see a sight. The city of the living God. Now, we're not giving a lot of the details, but you go back over here to chapter 22, book of Revelation. We're told about walls and chapter 21 and gates and a stream of gold and a throne and a river coming out of the throne and on either side of the river, the trees of life and so on and so forth. My guess is, glimpse number one, bingo, you're going to know you're at God's city. Amen. God's city. Not talking about Buffalo City, not talking about New York City, God City. Can you imagine your, what it's going to be like to think, hey, he is, I'm here. We're fixing to get this stuff together. Gosh. Well, there he goes, y'all. Not only to the, the city of the living God, also known as the heavenly Jerusalem, but to an innumerable company of angels. Every once in a while, somebody will come out with a book. I saw an angel. I'm going to write me a book. Get rich. We ain't talking about seeing an angel. We ain't talking about being touched by an angel. We're not talking about California angels. We're talking about seeing first glimpse a bunch of angels too many to count. I can tell that don't excite anybody else in here. Y'all, that blows me away. We're not even sure what they look like. We got a record of them. Some of them got wings flying around, hovering around God. Other looked so much like human beings. They were referred to as men. All I know is the second thing that's going to dawn on the person that chooses to believe what the Bible says is that we've seen the city of God. Next, it's surrounded by an innumerable number of angels. And then third, the church of the firstborn, the general assembly. A few more details there. Those that are written in heaven, i.e., anybody here ever known somebody that got saved as a Christian? They're not here anymore. Like my father-in-law, he's gone. He would like vacated the premises, but he went somewhere else. You know where they are? Verse 23. Amen. They're in heaven right now. Amen. Uh, down through the years, people say, well, you know, will, will I recognize my loved ones there? The, the clear implication is absolutely. Mm -hmm. They recognized Elijah and Moses. Nobody had ever seen their picture. Right. We're going to see the city of God, know what it is. We're going to see an innumerable company of angels and know who they are. And then we're going to start focusing in on the saints. God. These were the cats that had their name written in heaven. Anybody here got your name written in heaven this morning? You think, well, you know, that's some of that preacher talk. No, it's not, y'all. The Bible says that when a sinner repents and comes to God, there's joy in heaven. Amen. And then he writes down our name in the book of God. Hallelujah. It's like going to a dinner and finding your name card at a plate. Mm -hmm. You ever been to a dinner and had somebody ask you to leave? <laughs> Who are you? What in the world makes you think you are to be here? You going back down to McDonald's, you don't deserve to be up here at Burger King. <laughs> Y'all, 
the names of the saints written, and you're going to see it. I don't know how it's all going to look, but we're told right there that we're going to see it. And then you're going to see God, the judge of all the spirits of just men, made perfect. Not only his city, but him. Amen. And there they are again. All the spirits that left the human, the earthly bodies. And now they're made complete. I've often wondered when, you know, when an old saint leaves here, when they get to heaven, are they young again? Are they old like they were when they left? I don't have a clue, y'all. You know. I don't know. Some of y'all are thinking, no, I'm going to be pretty when I get there. <laughs> well, if you ain't pretty now, I don't know what makes you think. <laughs> Maybe you will be, y'all. I don't, I don't know. It'll be whatever suits God. But our first glimpse, that old gospel song talked about the first day in glory. This is the first glimpse. What's at stake? Well, you can hang out with rich men over in chapter 16, book of Luke, or you can go this route. <laughs> Nothing yet seen of this, but then he adds to it in verse 24, you can see Jesus, the mediator. That's King James for go-between. In other words, the reason you'll be there. I'm not going to be there because of my preaching. I'm going to be there in spite of my preaching. That, that would have been an excellent time to amen. <laughs> You'd have been on target. No one will be there for any other reason than Jesus. Amen. Who with his blood sprinkled, did something a whole lot better than Abel had any idea, though he offered an animal. God accepted that offering. But we're going to see. Again, Snippet, a little clip, if you will, the city of God, angels beyond number, the church, God the judge, the spirits of men made perfect, and Jesus. What's at stake? Eternal. Amen. Obvious conclusion, verse 25. See that you receive not him that speaks. Amen? This is not very spiritual, but it's probably a good place to use that uh, modern-day expression. Duh. The guy that went to hell wanted but one thing. To get out. Mm -hmm. Amen? You ever been someplace you wanted to get out of? Courtroom? <laughs> Family gathering? Whatever. He wanted out of hell. Don't have any record of anybody saying, gosh, it's, this is it's a letdown. I'd rather be somewhere else. I don't think so. You may be here today and you say, well, how does all that affect me? Well, it affects you the way it would anybody else. You've got a decision to make. If you've not made it already, you have a decision to make. It, it affects eternity, but it has to be made now. You say, well, I, can I put it off till tomorrow? Sure you can. But putting it off till tomorrow means today, no. When I tell an insurance man I'll think about it, it equals no. Amen. May change my tune someday. May wish I had it on another day. But right now it means this conversation is over. And if you've not made a decision for Christ, then you're telling him no. And you may have another chance. You may not. But the choice is yours. What's at stake? Your eternity. You're here today and you've made your choice for Christ. Anybody regret that? Never. Absolutely. Oh, what a Savior we have. I'm going to ask you to pray with him. Our group's going to come and sing a song. Give us the opportunity to respond. You know, uh, in Scripture, everyone that Jesus called, he called public. He, for whatever his reason, he wanted people to be willing to stand up and acknowledge him in front of their peers. I get the impression he don't want any of us to be ashamed of him. I have been ashamed of Jesus in days gone by. But now it's dawning on me. The only reason I'll ever be in heaven is because of him. I'm not ashamed of him. The Lord's speaking to you today. Don't be ashamed. You're amongst friends here. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Heads bowed, eyes closed.
moment our group's going to sing. If you've got something you need to get off your shoulders uh, that's between you and God, not, not another soul in here needs to know anything about it, but if God's spoken, you need to acknowledge it and you need to do it publicly. Father, we're just so helpless. No strength, no wisdom. I have found out, Lord, I'm better at sinning than I am at anything else in life. But gosh, we're so thankful for Jesus. The mediator, the go-between. The one that shed his blood to pay our payment, our guilt debt. And that's for an unsaved man, and that's for a backslidden man, and that's for someone who's become lukewarm in the faith. It's for any sin of any kind. Thank you, Father. Please help us to grasp that. For that one who needs to do business with you today, completely private, completely intimately. Please help them. By the way, ask this prayer in Jesus' name. And as we remain in prayer, in a public place, I can still have a private moment. Ask you to come as our group said.